Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, my name is Dr. Guru Prasad Rao. I am the professor of biochemistry in Malacca Manipal Medical College, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Manipal. And I will be speaking about the topic screening, diagnosis and monitoring of diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus places an immense burden on the health economy of the world and India is now said to be the diabetes capital of the world. Diabetes mellitus is a multifactorial polygenic syndrome involving several different genes and it affects millions of people worldwide and it is projected that by the year 2030 almost 552 million people would be diagnosed with this condition. It happens to be the leading cause of blindness and amputation in the world and a major cause of renal failure, neuropathy, heart attacks and strokes. And the incidence of type 2 diabetes mellitus is increasing today due to changes in the lifestyle which have caused a sedentary lifestyle and increase in the incidence of obesity. So, in order to understand the screening, diagnosis and monitoring of diabetes, we need to have a background about the basic biochemistry of the hormone called insulin. So, insulin is a hormone secreted by the beta cells of the pancreas whenever the blood glucose levels rise after a meal. When the blood glucose levels increase, the glucose can enter into most cells and for example, if you consider this as a liver cell, once it enters, it will be oxidized to get energy through a pathway called glycolysis which it converts glucose to pyruvate or excess glucose may be stored as a polysaccharide called glycogen for storage uh, to be used during fasting or the excess glucose can be converted to triacylglycerol which is also commonly known as fat. Insulin, the hormone, promotes all the steps involved in this metabolism by promoting glucose uptake or the oxidation of glucose or its conversion to glycogen or fat. So, in the fasting state, metabolic changes occur in the liver and adipose tissue in order to maintain the plasma glucose levels in the organism. For example, in the liver, the stored glycogen is converted to glucose or non-carbohydrates like pyruvate can be converted to glucose by gluconeogenesis, which then goes out into the blood. This is essential in order to keep the brain functioning during fasting by providing glucose as the sole fuel. Insulin inhibits these processes of glucose output by the liver because insulin is secreted in the well fed state during which time the liver need not produce glucose but rather should store it. In the adipose tissue, whenever we are fasting, the stored fat or triacylglycerol is broken down by lipolysis into free fatty acids which are released into blood picked up by various tissues including the liver which oxidize it to get energy and subsequently produce compounds called ketones or ketone bodies. These ketone bodies are sent out of the liver into the blood to be used as energy fuels during the fasting state. Insulin is a known inhibitor of lipolysis. So, its insulin plays a very important role in the prevention of formation of ketone bodies. So, with this background, we can understand the clinical and biochemical findings in diabetes mellitus, how exactly a patient will present with. So, the initial presentations may be complaints of fatigue, weight loss and weakness, which can be understood to be due to the breakdown of muscle protein and breakdown of the adipose tissue fat as well as the inability of the muscles to use the glucose as energy fuel due to the lack of insulin. So, which results in high plasma glucose levels also called hyperglycemia and the excretion of glucose in urine. So, it is called glucosuria and 
characteristic clinical findings such as excessive urination known as polyuria, excessive thirst called polydipsia and excessive hunger polyphagia. These features are usually triggered by a brief illness such as a viral infection. And occasionally a diabetic patient may go into ketoacidosis due to the uncontrolled lipolysis resulting in uncontrolled production of ketone bodies due to the lack of insulin. So, we need to classify diabetes mellitus into various classes as prescribed by the professional bodies like the American Diabetes Association which are helpful in understanding the type and deciding the mode of treatment. The first category is called type 1 diabetes which was earlier known as insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or juvenile onset diabetes, but it is no longer called that way because it can be seen in adolescents and sometimes in adults also. So, it is due to an autoimmune destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas. The autoimmune response is when our immune system turns against our cells and produces antibodies to self antigens resulting in the loss of beta cells leading to absolute insulin deficiency. The second category is type 2 diabetes responsible for a majority of the cases of diabetes in the world which is often associated with obesity which results in insulin resistance or unresponsiveness of tissues like the liver or muscle to insulin. They do not adequately respond to insulin and also the beta cells of pancreas are unable to produce the requisite quantity of insulin, a condition known as dysfunctional beta cells. Besides these two major categories, there is one more important category seen during pregnancy, gestational diabetes mellitus. I will talk more about this subsequently. And besides these three categories, there are several monogenic causes for diabetes, neonatal diabetes, maturity onset diabetes of the young or diabetes secondary to other conditions like cystic fibrosis, inflammation of the pancreas or patients receiving drugs like corticosteroids or patients receiving treatment for HIV AIDS or post organ transplantation, diabetes mellitus also has been reported. So, if we compare the two major categories of diabetes mellitus type 1 and type 2 listing the various characteristics. The age of onset for the type 1 diabetes is typically childhood or puberty and for type 2 diabetes is usually over the age of 35 even though these are not hard and fast rules. The nutritional status of a type 1 diabetes patient is usually malnourished whereas a type 2 diabetic patient is often obese. The prevalence of type 1 diabetes is about around 10 percent whereas about 90 percent of the cases are due to the type 2 diabetes. The defect or deficiency in type 1 diabetes is beta cell destruction due to autoantibodies resulting in complete lack of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, it is insulin resistance and dysfunctional beta cells which do not produce the sufficient quantity of insulin. And the treatment, type 1 diabetic patients need insulin to stay alive whereas type 2 diabetes can be managed by dietary modifications, exercise interventions, oral drugs and occasionally insulin also may be required. So, coming to the laboratory investigations in diabetes mellitus, we will make a list of the different tests which are done in the labs for diabetic patients. The first one is plasma glucose measurement, the second one is an oral glucose tolerance test, the third one is glycated hemoglobin test urine glucose and ketones detection, microalbuminuria test. So, starting with the plasma glucose measurement. So, usually it is performed by a method using enzymes called glucose oxidase and peroxidase which are employed in various automated analyzers used in the labs and also in handheld glucometers which are used by patients at home or in the hospital's bedside and normal levels of glucose in the fasting state. So, one test where the patient is asked to fast overnight for at least 10 hours and the plasma glucose is tested in the morning, it is called fasting plasma glucose and the normal range is expected to be 60 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. Another type of glucose test is when a patient is given a meal and 2 hours later plasma glucose is tested, it is called 2 hour postprandial plasma glucose. 
the normal range for which is 80 to 140 milligrams per deciliter. And if a test is done at any time of the day regardless of fasting, it is called random plasma glucose and the range for which is 60 to 140 milligrams per deciliter. The second major test is the oral glucose tolerance test. So, in this test, a patient's body is challenged with the load of glucose. This is often done if the other tests are not conclusive enough to diagnose diabetes. So, the patient is prepared for this test by being advised to take a good carbohydrate diet for the three days prior to the starting of the test and avoiding drugs which influence carbohydrate metabolism such as steroids or oral contraceptives for at least two days prior to the test and avoid strenuous exercise on the day before the test as well as during the test because all these factors may change the body's response to a glucose challenge. And the patient is asked to fast the pri overnight prior to the test. And on the morning of the test, a fasting blood and urine sample is collected, which is called zero hour sample. And the patient is given a solution of glucose, 75 grams dissolved in 300 ml of water to drink. And blood and urine sample is collected at the end of two hours as per the recommendations of WHO, which is the currently used version of this test. And the glucose level is measured in the blood samples. Urine samples are tested for the presence of glucose. And the normal response should be the fasting plasma glucose should be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And two hour post glucose load sample, the reading should be less than 140 milligrams per deciliter. The third test during diabetes mellitus is an important one called glycated hemoglobin or HbA1c. So, hemoglobin as we know is a protein present in the RBCs which is responsible for oxygen transport. So, RBCs are in the plasma and they are exposed to the glucose levels in the plasma. So, when glucose levels rise, they can bind to the amino group of amino acids in hemoglobin in a process called non-enzymatic glycosylation. So, glucose bound to the N-terminal valine of the beta chains of hemoglobin converts hemoglobin into a species called HbA1c. So, once HbA1c is formed, it stays in the RBC till the end of the lifespan of the RBC which is typically 120 days and does not change. So, normally about 5.7 percent or less of the hemoglobin is glycated and it will be increased in a diabetic patients because they have sustained high glucose levels in the plasma. So, HbA1c test unlike plasma glucose is a measure of the average plasma glucose levels over the preceding 10 to 12 weeks. So, this number is derived from the fact that RBCs typically have a lifespan of almost 4 months and the average level of plasma glucose over the preceding 3 months decides how much HbA1c is formed and it is a better indicator of glycemic control than plasma glucose. It is useful in monitoring response to treatment in a diabetic patient and it is not affected by recent food intake or stress. So, if a patient does excessive restriction of carbohydrate intake prior to the day of the test, the plasma glucose level may appear to be low where or if the patient is stressed due to some reason, plasma glucose may show a spike. But these factors do not affect HbA1c results. That is why it is more useful in monitoring the response to treatment in a diabetic patient. Let us come to the criteria for diagnosis of a diabetes mellitus. How does a doctor decide to diagnose diabetes mellitus looking at the results of the tests? If the pl fasting plasma glucose is equal to or more than 126 milligrams per deciliter or if the 2 hour plasma glucose during OGTT is equal to or more than 200 milligrams per deciliter or if the HbA1c is more than 6.5 percent or if a random plasma glucose equals 200 milligrams per dl or more with the classic symptoms of diabetes mellitus. So, the HbA1c test needs to be looked at very carefully because it can be subject to interference in some conditions. So, the advantages of this test are that it does not require the patient to fast overnight, 
and is not affected by day to day changes due to stress and illness. Whereas, the disadvantages include it is expensive, not available in all the labs and is subject to interference by hemoglobin variants. So, factors to be considered while interpreting HbA1c results age of the person. So, HbA1c is more suitable for diagnosing diabetes in adults rather than in children where glucose levels are more useful in diagnosis. Hemoglobinopathies which are diseases due to abnormal hemoglobin like sickle cell hemoglobin or HBS or HBC which is an abnormal hemoglobin may interfere with some of the tests for HbA1c. So, in such situations a test which is not subject to such interference should be chosen and conditions where erythrocyte survival is decreased. For example, false low HbA1c levels may be seen if the patient has undergone least recent blood loss or transfusion or erythropoietin therapy. So, erythropoietin is given to increase RBC production in an anemic patient or if the patient has hemolytic anemia where, where the RBCs are not surviving their full lifespan or sickle cell disease where the RBCs again undergo hemolysis. If the RBCs do not survive for their full lifespan, their mean exposure to glucose will be less and the HbA1c level may appear to be less than what it actually is which results in missing the diagnosis of a diabetes in some patients. On the other hand, false high HbA1c levels may be seen in iron deficiency anemia in which the hemoglobin concentration itself will be decreased since the HbA1c result is always expressed as a percentage of total hemoglobin. In such situations, the percentage may appear to be falsely increased. So, we should not over diagnose diabetes in such patients and their iron status should be determined. So, confirmation of diagnosis. It is rarely that just one test is enough to diagnose diabetes. So, in the absence of a clear clinical picture, any abnormal result must be repeated. So, repeat the same test for example, plasma glucose, 2 hour plasma glucose, HbA1c or random plasma glucose should be repeated or a different test should be done to confirm the diagnosis. If the patient for example, has HbA1c above 6.5 percent, but fasting plasma glucose less than the cutoff 126 is still diagnosed with diabetes and if the results are near the margin of diagnosis, it needs to be repeated after 3 or 6 months. So, let us look at a condition called pre-diabetes. Those individuals whose glucose results do not meet the criteria for diabetes diagnosis, but are too high to be considered as normal. The categories of these people are at increased risk for developing diabetes later. For example, if the fasting plasma glucose is 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter, it is called impaired fasting glucose. The WHO prescribes a range of 110 to 125 for diagnosing impaired fasting glucose or if the 2 hour plasma glucose after GTT is in the range of 140 to 199 milligrams per deciliter, it is called impaired glucose tolerance or if the HbA1c is in the range of 5.7 to 6.4. So, any of this is considered as a pre-diabetic condition. These people need to be followed up closely because they are at risk for developing diabetes later on. So, criteria for testing in asymptomatic adults. So, in the developed countries, there are recommendations that even people without any symptoms should be screened. So, who should be screened? When should it begin? So, if the person is overweight with a body mass index greater than 25 or if the person is an Asian, for example, including Indians, the body mass index is greater than 23 with one or more of the following risk factors. If the person by occupation tends to be physically inactive or if they have first degree relatives with diabetes or if they belong to a high risk ethnic group like Asians or African Americans, women who have had gestational diabetes mellitus, people who had a history of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure or dyslipidemia which is HDL cholesterol which is the good cholesterol being less than 35 milligram per DL or triglycerides more than 250 milligrams per deciliter. Besides this, 
The other criteria is pre-diabetic states of impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance. Such people should be followed up by being tested on a yearly basis. And in the absence of any of the above criteria, any person over the age of 45 should be tested and the repeated of the test should be done once in three years more frequently if needed. Autoantibody test in type 1 diabetes is a special test which can detect islet cell autoantibodies or antibodies to glutamic acid decarboxylase, insulin or tyrosine phosphatases. These are often tested in relatives of patients with type 1 diabetes mellitus to assess their risk for developing diabetes later on. Now, risk-based screening for type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes in children and adolescents who do not show symptoms. It is important in present times to uh, check children as well as teenagers for the likelihood of diabetes due to the altered lifestyle which has been brought about by technological revolution. So, today's generation spends less time outdoors and more time using electronic gadgets and is having easy access to calorie rich junk food. So, if some child shows the following criteria like overweight, body mass index greater than the 85th percentile for age and sex, the weight for height being more than the 85th percentile or if the weight is more than 120 percent, what is ideal for a particular height along with one of the following risk factors such as mother has a history of diabetes or had gestational diabetes during the child's gestation or the family history of type 2 diabetes in first or second degree relatives or if they belong to a high risk ethnicity such as Asians including Indians or if they show signs of insulin resistance. Now, coming to an important category of diabetes that is gestational diabetes mellitus. So, gestational diabetes is not when a diabetic woman becomes pregnant, it is the diabetes diagnosed first during the pregnancy. If diabetes is diagnosed during the second or third trimester of pregnancy, which was not clearly overt diabetes prior to gestation. This diabetes often resolves itself after delivery. So, why are we concerned about this temporary condition? The reason is women with gestational diabetes are at risk for developing diabetes later on in life and it is also associated with increased birth weight for the fetus and may result in mortality in the newborn baby. So, that is why all pregnant women need to be screened for gestational diabetes. The WHO recommends that every pregnant woman undergo screening for gestational diabetes. So, how to diagnose gestational diabetes? There are two types of strategies. The first one being a one step strategy using 75 grams glucose in oral glucose tolerance test recommended by Diabetes in Pregnancy Study Group India or DIPC. This is practiced by all the obstetricians gynecologists in India. So, at 24 or 28 weeks of gestation, a woman is given 75 grams of glucose regardless of whether she is fasting or not and 2 hours later a plasma glucose is measured and if it is exceeding 140 milligrams per deciliter, gestational diabetes mellitus is diagnosed. If it is between 120 to 139 milligrams, it is considered as gestational glucose intolerance. Such women will be carefully followed up during the pregnancy and if it is less than 120 milligrams, it is considered as normal. Elsewhere in the world, a two-step strategy is followed like in the United States, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists follows a two-step strategy where the first step at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation, 50 gram load of glucose is given in the non-fasting state and a single blood set test is done at the end of one hour. If the plasma glucose level is more than 140, then the lab proceeds to a second step of a 100 gram glucose tolerance test. If the result is less than 140, the person is considered as normal. So, let us look at the second step. After an overnight fast, fasting plasma glucose is measured, 100 gram glucose is given in water followed by three blood tests at the end of one hour, two hour and three hour after giving glucose. 
gestational diabetes is diagnosed if at least two of the following values are exceeded. If the fasting is more than 95, one hour value is more than 180, two hour is more than 155 and three hour is more than 140 milligrams per deciliter. So, what are the recommendations for testing in gestational diabetes? So, if the pregnant woman comes for an antenatal checkup for the first time, a blood glucose test must be done to detect diabetes which was not diagnosed before. If it is normal, then test for gestational diabetes at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation and test women with gestational diabetes for persistent diabetes after delivery around 4 to 12 weeks after delivery and women with the history of gestational diabetes must have lifelong screening for the development of actual diabetes or pre-diabetes for at least once in every 3 years and those who have the history of GDM must be given intensive lifestyle interventions to prevent the possibility of development of type 2 diabetes. Let us look at some special tests which are not often done and not available in every lab, glycated albumin and fructosamine. These are other glycated proteins. So, just like the hemoglobin in the RBC is exposed to glucose, even the plasma proteins including albumin are exposed to glucose as well and they undergo non-enzymatic glycation. So, if the plasma protein albumin is glycated, it is called glycated albumin, whereas the total serum proteins which are glycated is referred to as fructosamine. These indicate a short term glycemic status, unlike HbA1c which indicates glycemic control over the previous 3 months, these two tests tell us the glycemic status over the preceding 2 to 3 weeks. When would that be useful? It is a better index of glycemic control in diabetics who are undergoing hemodialysis which affects the RBC's lifespan are also those who have anemia or on erythropoietin therapy which otherwise may show low HbA1c but will be better diagnosed if you use glycated albumin or fructosamine because they are not affected by anemia. It is also preferred as an index of glycemic control in women with gestational diabetes because they need to be followed up more frequently rather than once in 3 months. So, ketones earlier I mentioned that insulin prevents formation of ketone bodies. So, in type 1 diabetes especially ketones levels increases and causes ketoacidosis. So, ketones can be measured in the urine or blood as an adjunct to the diagnosis and monitoring of diabetic ketoacidosis which is a serious complication often seen in type 1 diabetes. Urine glucose can be tested using dipsticks but it is not a preferred test for diagnosis or monitoring of diabetes mellitus because it does not correspond or tell us about the plasma glucose levels. Another special test which is done in most labs these days is microalbuminuria test. It is a test which detects albumin in the urine in the range of 30 to 300 milligrams per day and it is detectable only by special sensitive tests and it predicts the impairment of renal function in diabetic patients. It serves as a signal of early reversible kidney damage so that if you detect microalbuminuria, patient may be more stringently managed to prevent possible kidney disease due to diabetes and also serves as an early marker of cardiovascular disease. So, the diabetic complications, why are health professionals worried so much about diabetes? Diabetes can result in acute complications such as ketoacidosis or hyperosmolar coma, but more importantly the long term complications can be debilitating such as microvascular changes in the capillaries resulting in nephropathy or diabetic kidney disease which may lead to renal failure or retinopathy which may lead to blindness and also macrovascular changes in the large blood vessels may cause cardiovascular disease, stroke or gangrene and it may also result in cataract and peripheral neuropathy seen in diabetes. The reason why long standing high plasma glucose levels may result in all these complications is because the sugars can react with the amino groups in proteins to form a linkage called shift base which may readjust to form a ketoamine linkage 
which eventually forms advanced glycation end products or AGEs. These AGEs are said to be behind most of the diabetic complications. So, that is why glycemic control is very important in diabetes to pre prevent complications. So, tighter glycemic control has been shown to reduce the risk of diabetic complications. So, HbA1c measurement should be repeated once in 3 months in a diabetic patient who does not have good glycemic control or not responding very well to the medicines. Whereas, if a patient is responding well and showing better glycemic control, it is recommended that HbA1c test be repeated once in 6 months and it happens to be the mainstay of assessment of glycemic control. But there is a need for specific biomarkers for early detection of individual complications. But at present, none of the labs offer any specific biomarker to detect the presence of complications. However, there are certain tests which will help the physician determine the possibility of development of complications. So, they include a test for CRP or C-reactive protein which can be detected by a high sensitivity test. So, it is called HSCRP, a high sensitivity test for C-reactive protein which is a protein produced by the liver and is a marker of inflammation. So, it predicts the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus according to some studies and is strongly associated with atherosclerosis in type 2 diabetes. If a diabetic patient shows high serum HSCRP, they need to be more stringently controlled to prevent the possibility of a heart attack. Serum AGEs or advanced glycation end products, some people have come up with tests based on ELISA technique to measure serum AGEs which reflect the severity of coronary arterial sclerosis in type 2 diabetic patients and they positively correlate with long term glycemic control as measured by HbA1c. Pentocidine is another advanced glycation end product measured by HPLC technique correlates with hypertension and ischemic heart disease in diabetic patients, but none of these tests are currently in laboratory use. So, summarizing the talk, for screening a population for diabetes, all those above the age of 45 should be screened and if they are found to be non-diabetic, the screening should be repeated once in 3 years. People with risk factors such as obesity, hypertension or dyslipidemia should be screened more often. People who are diagnosed with pre-diabetes should be tested on a yearly basis. Overweight children or adolescents with risk factors should be screened. Pregnant women should be screened for gestational diabetes. If they are found to be diabetic, must be treated and followed up on a yearly basis for the development of actual diabetes. Autoantibodies tests are special tests done in relatives or patients with the type 1 diabetes to assess their risk for development of type 1 diabetes. As far as monitoring goes, HbA1c happens to be the mainstay of monitoring of glycemic control once in 3 months or 6 months and special tests like glycated albumin and proctosamine are done in those conditions where HbA1c may not be reliable. And blood and urine ketones are tested in the monitoring of diabetic ketoacidosis. So, at the end I have a few questions for practice. This is a case of a patient with sickle cell disease who is being screened for diabetes. His fasting plasma glucose is 157 milligrams per dl and HbA1c is 6.1 percent. Which of the following is the best approach to this patient in order to confirm or rule out diabetes mellitus? These are the options. A. Repeat the HbA1c test which showed up to be 6.1 percent. Repeat the fasting plasma glucose conduct an oral glucose tolerance test or detect urine glucose. And the right answer is B, repeat the fasting plasma glucose. The fasting plasma glucose if you see in this question is above the diagnostic cutoff, but I, like I mentioned earlier, every test should be repeated for confirmation. Whereas the HbA1c in this patient is not above the diagnostic cutoff, plus, uh, plus we must keep in mind that the patient is having sickle cell disease, which I mentioned that it will interfere with the HbA1c test, therefore is not reliable and should not be used for diagnosis.
and OGTT and urine glucose are not necessary to be done in this case. Another question, a patient has fasting plasma glucose 118 milligrams per dl, 2 hour plasma glucose in an OGTT is 139 milligrams per dl and A1C is 6 percent. Which of the following is the status of this patient? Impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance or diabetes mellitus? And the right answer is impaired fasting glucose because fasting glucose should be less than 100 whereas 139 2 hour plasma glucose is within the normal range and HbA1c at 6 percent does not tell us that it is diabetes. So, the right answer is impaired fasting glucose. The third question, a known diabetic patient who is not able to control his glycemic status very well needs to be advised when to come for the next test or follow up. Which of the following time durations is most ideal for his next HbA1c test? after 1 month, after 3 months, after 6 months or after 1 year and the right answer is after 3 months because HbA1c tells us about the glycemic status over the preceding 3 months and in patients who are not well controlled they need to be tested once in 3 months whereas if he was well controlled could have been tested after 6 months. Thank you very much.